Good afternoon. Thanks, Becky. Um, right, so this, my first, uh, my first 10 minutes is going to be um, a history talk, really, about me and what we did um, and how we got to where we got to. So I'll have to put some context in it. So I founded the company in 20... 2000? Yeah, 2000. Uh, I'm an ex-city broker, which will come relevant in a minute, and I'm a lapsed Kiwi, so any problems understanding, I'll speak a bit slower or whatever. Um, especially after the All Blacks performance at the weekend, but that's another story. So um, I was working in the city and um, wasn't really enjoying it. My wife, or now ex-wife, she was my ex-wife at the time, but she's my ex-wife now, um, had also been working in the city, and she left, and she was working for a family steel, uh, steel firm, and they were, they were having challenges. Hang on, sorry. I can't see the next slide, so. Context, 1999, 56K dial-up, no YouTube, no Stack Overflow, Yahoo was a top engine, and high res was 800 by 600. So, I mean, this is what I'm working with, okay? So, um, that's the context, that's where we're at, that's what I've got to play with. So, in 1999, I built a steel trading platform. I was also a great graphic designer, by the way, if you like that. Um, I built a steel trading platform, which allowed people like my ex-wife's uh, business to source large amounts of steel by, rather than spending, a f um, spending hours and hours on the phone calling up relevant suppliers, it would be one phone call or one email, and I'd send it out to all the suppliers in the UK. Just like we were doing in the city, someone would call up and ask for a price. I, I would have 10 guys sitting around a desk and they were all speaking to, t to 10 banks and I'd say, I need a price on this. And within 30 seconds, I'd have the best price either side of the market back to them. So I built this and I thought this would be a brilliant idea. I spoke to my accountant. He said, next time, next, this time next year, you'll be a millionaire. And I went, this is fantastic. I quit my job in the city. Uh, unfortunately, we were still on dial-up. People were checking their emails once a week, so this urgency of getting these prices back wasn't happening. But I sold it on. We now had 340 members. So I went and pitched this idea to the UK Steel Stockholder Association. These were the guys who ran all the suppliers. And they, um, they thought I was the worst person on the planet. I was personally ruling the, ruling the steel industry in the UK, and, um, yeah, so that was a great idea that went down the toilet. Uh, I now had no job. So I've got to sort of, so I set up a, a small web design agency in 2000. Um, but still, my role, what, what I wanted to do was I wanted to solve people's problems. So the next problem came up was that the local dentist, people weren't turning up to People weren't turning up to um, appointments and it was costing him money. So I built an email or an SMS reminder system. So we're sending out, my, again, great graphic design skills. Um, so <coughs> we uh, were sending out text messages. This blew out to being email marketing. We had an on-site email editor with previews, with list management, unsubscribes. And this was, this was in 2000, 2001. We were running scheduled campaigns and we had onboard analytics. As we all know, Google Analytics didn't come around for another four or five years. So we were kind of ahead of the curve. This is what we were doing. Um, uh, we continued working on it. Well, when we, I continued working on it for several years. But then you've sort of got to choose your pick, pick your battles. And we sort of outsourced to other, uh, other services after this. But this was going quite well. So then in 2003, we built our first e-commerce business. But this is, I mean, this is... This is full screen, by the way. That's six, 800, 800 by 600 pixels. This is for a company in um, Boston. It had an onboard CMN, CMS. It had product management. We were running client comms, emails. It had website traffic analytics, so we knew where everything was coming from, who was buying what. And this is predating Magento by five years. So this is built from the ground up. Um, unfortunately, this was being hosted on a server underneath my desk in the spare room. So um, we featured in an email newsletter called The Daily Candy in America, which used to go out to tens of thousands of people. And this was the featured product, which took the server down uh, constantly for about a week. 
Um, so one of the things I've learned is don't host it on a computer underneath your desk. But anyway, so um, <clears throat> so this was this was pretty successful. Um, it was built from the ground up. We were using uh, ASP technology at the time. The next uh, the next e-commerce project was a year later, and this was a canvas printing website. People could upload their own photos. They could add special effects. Uh, again, but this was using our first e-commerce platform, and it was called Ensemble, Ensemble 1.0. So, uh, and it was integrated. It was actually talking to Bebo, so it was running email marketing through their own content management system into this other website I built. And the way our Bebo system was working is, again, we had pixels on all our websites. We weren't running cron jobs, so we had a pixel on every website we built that would trigger to set: is there any emails to go out? Is there any emails or text messages? So we were sort of sneakily doing stuff like that as well. So, um, so that's Ensemble 1.0. But we continued to, to build it and build it. And we had four or five other websites. So we're all running it. But we're running different versions. Everyone had a different requirement, what they wanted, what they needed. Uh, but we, I mean, coming from the city, I love numbers, reporting. So we had loads and loads of reporting. We had an onboard search. Um, Furniture Today was the first version that was using, we were actually building static pages on the website, so they weren't dynamically being generated, so they were being indexed faster by Google, they are being painted on the page faster. We're automating client comms as well. Again, this is 2006, so we had uh, incomplete order emails going out, and people also bought emails going out. Um, the server side uh, building static pages was sort of copied from a system called Actinic, not copied, but it was research, really. But, uh, and our first real integration was to Sage 100. Um, <laughs> problem is we now have got about 10, 20 versions of, of our ensemble out there floating. So we floating around. And maintaining it was just becoming I mean, uh, resource heavy. So we rebuilt it in 2010 uh, and brought all our customers onto the single version. Well, but these, these systems were still predominantly isolated. They weren't talking to other third parties. They were running people's businesses. So they had onboard CRM systems. We were running multiple currency uh, and languages. Um, but they were running their businesses on our website. And there was a lot, of, a lot of pressure to keep these websites up and running. We also started sh um, integrating with third party. Wow, is that? It's counting down here. Yeah. Sorry. Um, Third party, third party integrations. So more and more, we were looking at outside tools to extend what our system was doing. Eventually, we became a piece of middleware, and we had all these plugins on the outside that we were talking to. So rather than being an e-commerce platform per se, we were now becoming an ecosystem, integrating and allowing people to run businesses from ERPs and MRPs um, that they could continue to run their business as they'd always done. These are no longer startups or smaller businesses, but significant enterprise businesses that already had a system in place, but they didn't have these other. We were adding the, the last 30% of the puzzle. They were, we're getting them over the line by, by building these other, these other systems. And our ensemble was now becoming the middleware. So the middleware, we were now integrating into these ERP systems. So we currently integrate with Greentree and Diplomat and Xero and Insight, uh, QuickBooks and HubSpot. And all this was happening behind the scenes. The, the companies were running the businesses and never actually having to touch their websites. So these were running, well, these do run independently. One particular example is that um, Darrow is a, is a uh, they sell kitchen hardware. And they, we've, we've introduced machine learning and AI. So they have emails coming in with attachments. Uh, our system is now listening to the attachments, digesting, and trying to work out what it is. We're building purchase orders. Create, well, we're reading these purchase orders and creating uh, either a JSON call to a third party API to pass that data in or into the ERP system. So again, we're freeing up time. The middleware is now automatically doing this stuff in the middle and not actually having to worry about, because invisible e-commerce, we called it, because the orders are coming in via email and getting posted straight into this system. So what do we learn? Well, don't listen to your accountant. Don't quit your 
multi-million pound job in the city or whatever it was. Uh, manage technical debt. Choose what you're good at. Get, I mean, get rid of the multiple, multiple different versions of the website. Choose your battles. So obviously, Bebo bowed out uh, down to, to back to people like um, the MailChimp, far more efficient. Automate where possible and keep on innovating that one. That's what I learned. Anyway, so I know I'm going to now hand it over to uh, my friend Alfie. Thank you. Afternoon, everyone. As if by magic, can Alfie appears? Um, so I work uh, alongside Brandt, as you know, uh, looking after clients and taking what our clients want and working with uh, our developers to turn them into a reality. So I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about what it is that we're seeing coming up time and time again. Uh, the guys want to achieve it, the retailers want to achieve it, businesses want to achieve it, uh, and they need our help on how to do it. The first thing that they want to achieve is that they want to run their business. They don't want to be running a website or a stock management system or whatever it is. They know how to deliver a great service to their customers. They know how to deliver great products. They know how to do what it is that they set up to do. They don't necessarily know how to run a website. They're not all marketeers. They also, because of being good at their business, being good at their products, their services, whatever, they know the process that they need to follow to be able to get what they need at the end. They need to be able to achieve that through technology and not have the technology dictate the way that they run their business. And that's really important to them because now more than ever, I've got to press twice for that slide. Now more than ever, uh, they want to have time back within their business. We are seeing more and more businesses happy to invest capital if it means that their staff are freed up to do what they're great at, whether it's innovation, whether it's servicing clients, whether it's delivering more, uh, more value. Somehow, businesses and uh, bosses want time back within their business. Um, and how are they achieving that? Well, they're achieving that, like Brandt said earlier, uh, with the invisible e-commerce example, uh, through uh, using this new team member that suddenly appeared. Uh, well, it's been around a long time, but everyone's suddenly remembering about uh, this concept of machine learning and AI. So suddenly, there's this new guy on the block who, about a year ago, uh, our colleague Matt did a talk, and everyone was worried that it was going to take away his job. But actually, that's not the case. The guys uh, are using machine learning, they're using AI, to complement their skill set, to complement their ability to deliver work, not to replace what they're doing. Because come back to this concept of needing time and needing to spend more time with customers. Well, if we can use AI and if we can use machine learning and if we can use automation and all of those good things to be able to free up that time, then why wouldn't you, right? So I, I looked at uh, one of our customers who has this automated email processor or automated order processor in place. Just to recap on that, someone sends in an email to a help desk type address. We are automatically listening to the email. We're automatically interrogating the PDF attachment and turning it into an order straight into uh, somebody's ERP system or CRM system without the need to manually download the PDF, open it in Acrobat and remove the 100 pop-ups that come up because you've not updated, print it out, look at it, type it in. We're doing it automatically. One customer. It sounds stupid, but we, we time-logged before we implemented the software, and they were spending about 30 minutes in order uh, typing it out, doing that process, and they were doing it for 20 orders a day. They're now saving six hours a day, which they're spending with customers on uh, increasing customer lifetime value, getting better products, getting a more dynamic service delivered, right? The bosses are happy because they've got that time back. They've effectively saved, a, saved somebody's day just by automating order processing. And that's a really small example of, of where we're seeing that uh, automation and intelligent automated decision making is coming into play. You know, look at chatbots, look at intelligent uh, filtering, look at all of those things, uh, dynamic trade pricing on websites, depending on uh, what category of account you have set up in your CRM system. All of those things that traditionally would require a account manager or a sales exec to help with, we're able to adopt with technology. Now, that means that customers, uh, our customers and businesses are spending more and more time thinking about that beginning part, thinking about the rest of the puzzle, those ERP systems, those CRM systems. They're thinking about payment processing in a lot more detail than they ever were before. So we're spending time 
uh, going through that workshopping phase and really identifying how it's going to come together in an ecosystem that not only helps customers externally through sales channels, whether that is their website, that order processing, applications, mobile apps, whatever it is, but also internally as well. How can we how can we produce internal tools as part of this puzzle, as part of this ecosystem that help, help staff do a better job for their customers? One of these, uh, in, a, in Blue Peter style, his something we made earlier, right? We made a, we made a sales portal for a um, boat manufacturer uh, down under in New Zealand. And um, the whole purpose of this was because it automated the sales process to customers and dealerships to an on-demand style service. Suddenly, boats, uh, in this instance, but sales could happen round the clock when they needed to happen without waiting on colleagues to come back with questions about parts and colors and what can go with what and what looks like good and what lead times are. Things were at people's fingertips again. Uh, we, they could access not just new sales, but they could also access uh, accounts information, orders, purchase orders, correspondence, all of the sort of stuff that, again, traditionally might need a person's input is at people's fingertips. They, they are working flexibly, so they need that information flexibly, whether it is on their phone, in a portal, in a fin client, in whatever it is. We're putting information, putting resources back at businesses and clients and our customers' customers' fingertips more so than ever before. Thinking about automation, thinking about accessibility, and thinking about portability as well. So it's almost time for the end of the talk. Uh, I've got three minutes, 15 seconds left. I mean, we've almost timed this perfectly, Brent. Uh, but I didn't want us to just talk at you for 17 minutes and then uh, walk away. I wanted you to make sure you had something actionable to take away as well, and some things I didn't uh, think about doing what Natesh did. I didn't think about giving you an hour of my time, although you're welcome to it. Uh, I've given you some actionable things that you can take away with your team, your uh, your budgets, your timelines, your capacity, all of those things, to be able to take that kind of way of thinking into uh, your business or your business, your customers' customers. So the first thing to think about that we're doing a lot more of and it's working really well is spending time with our customers, and like I say, our customers' customers, because we're an agency, holding workshops, holding customer user interviews, doing research, spending more time upfront to make sure that what we're doing is going to have a positive impact on the customer experience and the customer journey and all of those things. Because if we're spending more time thinking up front and researching features and knowing exactly what it is that this middleware or this website or this thing has got to do, we'll know how it's going to be helpful. And if we understand how it's going to be helpful and how our marketing colleagues can uh, educate people internally and externally on that functionality and that helpfulness, then they're going to get that buy-in and there's going to be that enthusiasm and that, that drive and that uh, demand for it. Once you've got those list of features, it's really important to stick to the detail, to stick to the plan and to actually do it, to build the feature and to launch the feature. Because if you do that, you're going to be helpful. You're going to be helpful to your marketing and sales colleagues. You're going to be helpful to your customers and your customers' customers. And suddenly, those OKRs and those KPIs are going to be hit. Bosses are going to be happy. We're going to be happy. And if we're happy, why not? That's what we want, right? <laughs> so that's actually the end, ladies and gentlemen. Um, with a minute to go, I need to slow down, clearly. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, that is the end, actually. I was Alfie. That was Brant. Back to Becky. Thank you.